Hello and welcome to the SAE Tomorrow Today podcast. I am your host, Grayson Brulte. On today's podcast, we're absolutely honored to have Bill Combs, Vice President, Connected Vehicle Strategy and Experimentation, Penske Transportation Solutions. Welcome to the podcast, Bill. Great to be here, Grayson. Super excited for this. Bill, you went to culinary school and worked 60 hours a week as a chef during school. What inspired you to become a chef? Well, it's, uh, I don't think you ever, uh, you know, know what path you're going to go down. I was actually on a path in the, I was in sales. Um, I worked for a, an electrical cable manufacturer and I called on uh, all kinds of utilities and electrical distributors and engineering firms and all kinds of things. And I was single and, you know, I was sitting on a plane one day and I was looking out the window and I said, you know, I don't have to do this. I don't have, no one's depending on me for, for uh, food and shelter and anything else. It's just, I'm the only one dependent on me. So um, I had actually cooked while I was in college and at a number of different restaurants and I loved it, you know, and I, I actually thought what a cool profession and, and uh, what a cool, you know, you have the front of the house, the back of the house, the whole kind of ecosystem around a, a restaurant. And uh, when, when I got off the plane, I said, you know what, I'm, I'm going to quit my job and I'm going to sell my house and I'm going to go to culinary school. So that's what I did. I was older than most of the kids there, or pretty much all the kids there. Um, but it was a really rewarding experience and the school part was was great from a foundational aspect but the working um, i think just in life in general you learn so much more on the job especially when you're doing something that you can be passionate about and uh so yeah it was it was really just a, a shift of of thinking and in, in life and and uh and a, and a new road to try and go down it's a wonderful road and it's a world I know uh, well. My mom went to Johnson and Wales uh, and it's a chef. Awesome. And so got to understand that world, I guess you could say too well and how the whole restaurant industry works. And you could see a lot of things that you'll know from the restaurant industry that are in other parts of the of the economy, especially around customer service and, and dealing with customers and situations. And, and earlier in your career, when you were a chef, you were uh, worked as a line cook under Jean-Marie Lacroix at his James Beard Award-winning restaurant Lacroix at the Rittenhouse. What was that experience like, go, stepping into that incredible restaurant for that experience? Yeah, so I had had some good um, experience before that, but nothing to the caliber of what Lacroix um, was. And, and he had won the James Beard Award a year or so before I started working there. So it was kind of all systems go. I mean, he was um, really in his um, heyday and um, putting out some incredible food. And I have never worked as hard as I did under um, his group. And it was just an incredible scene and you know you can read a lot about how the best restaurants function but to actually be there and to be kind of on that team and i think team is is the thing that i learned the most was just the incredible teamwork it takes you have to have a lot of very good performers doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing in exactly the right cadence um and be prepared for service some of the hardest work was actually before service just making sure you were ready because once people start coming through those doors, you're not going to be running anywhere to do any kind of extra prep. So um, hardest work I've ever done, probably the most rewarding work I had done, certainly to that point. From your incredible hard work that, that you put in in the back of the house, um, I've had the experience of actually eating in the restaurant and, and staying at the Written House. And it was an incredible experience both in the hotel um, and in the restaurant. What were some of your biggest takeaways from that time? Was it teamwork? And did you learn anything from the, the hotel side of the business since the, the restaurant was located in the written house? Yeah, interestingly, that's a really good question because I had worked in, when I went to school in Baltimore, I worked at a hotel there as well. And I, I loved it because in Baltimore, yes, I did get to be part of other aspects of the running the restaurants, um, uh, food supply chain, call it. Um, but you know, lots of big banquets. It was a, it was a really upscale hotel as well there. And so we did lots of weddings and big banquets and we had a really top notch restaurant, but we even got into when the, when the cooks doing room service needed help, we'd jump in and help those guys too. So, you know, that was a really, and that's why I went to work at a place like that, just to get a really broad 
experience. La Croix was a little bit different in that, yeah, the banquet chefs were down the hall, but they were the banquet chefs. They didn't want you messing with them and we didn't want them messing with us. <laughs> and the room service guys were doing their own thing too. So, um, but it was, it's really cool to be around that. Um, you have a lot of centralized groups like um, dishwashing and a lot of that kind of stuff that everything's coming to a central point. So everyone's got to sort of fight for some of the same resources, but, but we did run fairly autonomously, uh, between the different groups. So you learn teamwork and then you, it seems to me that you also learn supply chain constraints. Is that a fair assumption? So the banquet chef's trying to get this ingredient and Lacroix's trying to get this ingredient. Yeah. And you know, high-end restaurants are all about fresh, local, top-notch ingredients. And to be fresh, you know, you don't want just a bunch of freezers full of, full of, product. You know, you want to be bringing in different stuff all the time, working with the local farmers. So that this kind of idea of just in time was super important. So it was a daily routine for um, all of the cooks to make sure they had everything they needed for the next day. Because when you get in there at noon or 1 p.m. to prepare for service, you're you're off and running. If you realize then you have you don't have the right type of vinegar for a special dish or uh, the right sort of produce isn't there, you know, you're in trouble because you have a lot of work to do to get ready for the evening. And that's where you could see from, you know, having an incredible insight that I have into the restaurant industry where experimentation comes in, mixing in new ingredients. And at Penske Transportation Solutions, you're focused on connected vehicle strategy and experimentation. What are some of the neatest experiments that you've worked on at Penske? Yeah, I think there's a really cool um, parallel there that you bring up. And um, I've been thinking about it a bit lately. And it's um, this idea of you want to experiment, but there are certain food ingredients that don't go with other food ingredients. We all know that. <laughs> <laughs> so the same thing's true. I think, you know, I've, I've been my focus at Penske has been on technology for a number of years. And the same thing is true there. There are a lot of technologies out there in the in the environment and being able to pull those in and make practical use of them. And it's sort of the the coin, the term we've coined over the over the last couple of years has been practical innovation. So we aren't innovating just for innovation's sake. And the same thing could be said about restaurants. The the end product has to taste good. The end product in trucking has to make sense. There has to be ROI. It has to, you know, you have to be able to make money if you're in the trucking business. These aren't um, fancy sp sports cars in your driveway. These are tools. You don't buy trucks unless you have to buy trucks. Um, so, you know, I think it's a matter of what finding those technologies that can work um, for the trucking business is is a really interesting kind of dance. And it's a lot of the upfront piece is research. And, you know, the research we do up front is probably not different than, than most fleets and most people do. If you're interested in electric vehicles and you start to see new OEMs bring new vehicles onto the market, you start to look into it. We're in a really cool position at Penske where we're kind of in the middle of the whole value chain where we're not the OEM and we're not, in most cases, the end fleet. We're this sort of middleman and uh, it enables us to go out and talk to all these new providers. So um, it, I can think about a few different areas that have been really interesting as far as tying those together. And I know we'll get into it, but connected vehicle technologies, this is something that's been around for decades being able to take data from a truck. But how does Penske, who's in the middle of all this, take that data and start to utilize it so that we can use it for different parts of our business and deliver even more value back to our customers? So that in that case, we took existing telematics platforms and basically just repurposed the data. So we can take the same data set that a fleet's using to manage their business, see where their drivers are, make sure they're delivering on time and managing their fleet on a daily basis. And we can take that same data and use the same data set for billing odometer readings and for uh, fault codes from engines and, from, and for using odometer for um, scheduling maintenance on a, on a better uh, uh, 
basis than just saying four times a year, bring it in for an oil change. We can actually use data to drive a lot more efficiency and a lot more uh, value back to our customers. So that was kind of the early one where we said, this is really cool to think about. It's not, none of these systems were built for what we needed, but we made it something that could become a really valuable resource for us. And, and that's really interesting with the creating the value because when a chef does practical innovation with experiments, they want to create value and have a happy customer that's dining in their restaurant. When Penske uses practical innovation, you want to have a, a really happy fleet customer. And you've done some really interesting experimentations, and I want to touch on this one. In 2018, Penske Truck Leasing partnered with Daimler Trucks North America to test commercial electric Freightliner trucks in real-world situations. Was this an example of Penske seeing this coming electric vehicle trend? Let's put the Penske practical innovation to task because this at some point will become a major trend in our industry? Yeah, it really was. I mean, you know, I think a lot of things were happening then and EV obviously in the car, passenger car space was was becoming a bigger and bigger topic. And we knew it was coming into the the trucking sphere. And Daimler's long been one of our our best partners and um and suppliers of vehicles and we've always had a very good relationship with them and uh i know conversations you know happen over the years and and once daimler was ready to to dive into this and really start their own experimentation they took this interesting tact where they approached us to actually deploy 20 of the 31st prototypes or pre-production vehicles that they were coming out with. And it was going to be this co-creation. And that was from their CEO. That was his term to, to say, we're not just going to build these EVs and then hand them to some customers and see how they like them. We want to actually co-create um, these vehicles with the customers so we don't you know, we aren't missing anything. We aren't making assumptions based on whatever. And I think, you know, the idea was this idea of ecosystem. I mentioned it earlier about a kitchen, but um, it's really important when it comes to vehicles, especially when you think about EVs and the need for it's not just a new truck that you can just deploy the way we've deployed trucks for decades. It's it's an, it's a whole new charging uh, fueling infrastructure. It's a whole new way of, of thinking about range of vehicles and performance of vehicles. And, you know, there's a lot of assumptions based on what's happened in the passenger car space, but these are 80,000 pound trucks. How are they going to be different? And there's no way to know that without doing the experimentation. And then this case, it's been super powerful just because it's been Penske and Daimler working together to do that experimentation and learn. What did you learn together? What, did you go in there with some preconceived notions and you came out of there with a completely different mindset on how this will impact the future of trucking? I think you always go in with some assumptions. And, um, it, you know, we went in with a lot of trust between our two companies, just knowing all the work we've done historically together. Um, but, you know, I think there are things like range, um, you know, vehicle range. When you think about a diesel truck, if you have 200 gallons of fuel on some of these diesel trucks and even 300 on some trucks, depending on how many fuel tanks they have, um, and trucks nowadays getting somewhere in the neighborhood of actually 10 miles per gallon, you're talking thousands of miles a truck can go before they have to put more fuel in that truck. So you have to think about so when you talk about a truck that's going to get 150, 200 miles of range, the immediate thought or assumption is that's not enough. But when you really start digging into how fleets use trucks, it is rare that a truck's going to go a thousand miles without stopping, or at least for a number of hours. That is a long way. And there are all kinds of hours of service regulations and other things that pretty much tell you, you have to stop at some point. So, you know, when you, when you break down, uh, how fleets use vehicles, there is a tremendous amount of pickup and delivery, local type business, and even regional distribution where those trucks don't go more than 150 miles a day. So this actually works perfectly for certain types of applications. And as you can obviously think, um, as battery technology gets better and EV technology in general gets better and charging times get get faster, 
you can start to um, expand that sort of radius, call it, of, of how you can travel in a given day. So the average 18 wheelers just going about 150 miles. It's not that preconceived notion of, oh, here goes the 18 wheeler going from LA to Jacksonville. They're just going mainly within 150 miles of a depot. Definitely not. I mean, I think that is the, you know, perception that, that these trucks go, you know, coast to coast, they're delivering goods coast to coast, but a lot has changed in the distribution models. And, um, even not, you know, not because of EVs at all, um, really because of just efficiencies and setting up distribution centers and hub and spoke type of networks, trucks, and, and you have drivers that don't want to be gone for three weeks. You have drivers that actually want to be home at night or at least every other night or whatever the case is. So there's a lot more regional distribution and hub and spoke, which is, you know, so a truck can take, uh, a, a trailer full of goods from from one distribution center to another, um, and then another driver can take it further on down the road. So um, there's a lot of different types of networks that have been building out, and some of that's even due to some regulatory things that have happened, like hours of service um, and and other types of, of of regulations that mean drivers can only drive so far in a day anyway. So why don't we set up these networks to to further enhance? the use of the trucks and and make the most of, of just utilization in general. Was the hub and spoke model modeled after the, the, the big three, the Americans, the Deltas, the United that operate on the hub and spoke model? Was that the inspiration for this or was it purely based on uh, the regulatory environment? I think it was a, a mix of, I'm sure the concept, you know, or at least the naming of the concept maybe comes from, from the airlines. I'm not even sure to be honest, but um, you know, there are other pieces to it where when uh, when a big brand is thinking about how to get everything to their stores uh, in a given day, let's say like a Costco. OK, do you want every producer of goods delivering to every Costco store every day or do you want them delivering to a distribution center where you can put everything on a single tractor trailer and deliver everything that store needs on a daily basis so you don't have you know, 27 truckloads of, of stuff coming into a, to a warehouse market, you have one truck coming in or two trucks coming in per day with exactly what you need. So I think a lot of it has just been rethinking how supply chains work and, you know, the ability to just, uh, to break it down to where we can, we can do this back to that sort of just in time kind of thinking. You can have a distribution center centrally located to a number of different stores or outlets, and then you can bring the goods that are needed on a daily basis to those stores or outlets. The distribution center, I agree with you. I think that's the future. And on the previous podcast, we had the CEO of Gaddock AI that was focused on that middle mile from the distribution center to the Walmarts. And he was explaining very similar to you on how if there's a just in time thing or they're running low on say toilet paper or Clorox wipes, it's very timely now, they can bring those in there. So that was really interesting. And I'm really happy to hear that. So as we start to look at the traditional commercial trucking fleet, are electric trucks starting to get integrated in now? If you're, let's just call it Acme operator is operating, say a fleet of 100 or 200, maybe they're trying one or two um, electric trucks. Are you starting to see any of that experimentation happen? Yeah. Um, you know, the, what it comes down, there's a lot of want to do it and there is certainly some experimentation going on already and, but there's not a lot of vehicles. So, um, that's coming, that's sort of the wave that's coming. And like we talked about earlier with, with, the um, co-creation, uh, project we were doing with Daimler, that's still going on. So, you know, 2018, we started developing, the vehicles and thinking about the use cases and installing charging infrastructure. Um, and this year COVID's gotten in the way a little bit, but it's the year of the learning really. So the last couple of years were about building all of this up. And now we're, we have trucks fully deployed. The 20 that I talked about earlier are fully deployed to customers. Um, but it has the, the fact that these are out there even, um, and they are integrating, none of these are just standalone fleets that are running all electric. So they're, they're integrated with existing um, uh, diesel and, and other types of, of propulsion systems. And 
but it's driven a lot of interest to where now we start to see the fleets that are coming out saying, we're into this. We want to do this when the vehicles are ready. So I think there's a lot of preparation going on now because it will take a lot of preparation, um, probably more on the infrastructure side than, than anything else. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's, everyone's getting ready, whether it's thinking about how am I going to charge these trucks or how am I going to use them on a daily basis? And they are very interested in the learnings that are coming out of the, some of the early vehicles. I love the quote year of learning. And I think that's, it's a really powerful quote that it can apply to a lot of industries. And especially as you're starting to charge and you alluded to the infrastructure, how are you going to charge a heavy duty commercial truck and what type of energy or electrical backhaul does the grid have to be hardened since that's becoming a big debate now with the governor Newsom in California's executive order. It's starting to become top of mind. Now, if you can kind of talk about how these heavy duty trucks will be charged and what type of energy would be needed, that'd be really incredible to kind of round out uh, this vision. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the short story is they need a lot of power. And (laughs) (laughs) these are, you know, it's multiple cars all packed into one vehicle, basically, as far as the, the amount of energy they need. And, you know, the, the, a big difference is utilization. So uh, ideally, again, this is a tool and you want full utilization as close to hundred percent as you can get because you bought this vehicle and it has to pay itself off basically. Um, so you've got not just large battery packs that take a lot of power, but you're also utilizing the vehicle a lot more than someone would a passenger vehicle going from home to work and charging in their garage at night and everything's good to go. So charging is a major, uh, piece to this. So, and there, that is, uh, just a whole big area where you have to involve utilities and, um, rates and thinking about the grid, like you said, you know, the grid is an interesting thing and I, I'm not going to pretend I, I know a lot about it, but there's a lot of power in the grid. If you think of the grid overall, but where is the power? Where can I get at the power is really the big question. So we're kind of the endpoints. So right now it's it's going to be rare that a fleet, some big fleet that runs wants to run electric is right across the street from some massive substation that's just <laughs> waiting for customers uh, to use all that power. The, the grid has been built out to serve what's been needed. So it's what's in the early goings, I don't think we'll see, you know, uh, a a huge impact on the grid. But if you think about um, these um, industrial areas and warehouse areas where you have thousands of trucks, you have large fleets and companies like Penske, um, all in these sort of industrial areas. And you've got the UPSs, FedEx, Amazons kind of all as neighbors. When they start to go electric all in, then you're going to start to see okay, how are we getting this power, that much power to those locations? Because they're not going to, this isn't a thing where you just stop at a a fuel station for five minutes and and top off. There'll be some of that for sure. But when those trucks start their shift, whether it's day or night, they need to be fully charged. So a lot of that's going to be happening at the depots where the trucks actually reside or start their days. Um, so it, charging infrastructure is huge. It's a huge deal. And that's why I say that's where the preparedness thing is coming in. And there, the planning has got to start. If you want to deploy electric trucks at any sort of scale in a, in a year, two years, you need to start now as far as digging those holes, getting everything trenched in, getting power there, working with the utilities, figuring out where even is the best place for me to start? Because you can't just pick a spot and say, I want it right here. You have to work with the utilities and understand, is there power enough here? Or if there's not, how long is it going to take to get that delivered to my location? And that's a really good point. Um, there's a, a gentleman who's, who's well known and uh, a big media person I was consulting for years ago. And we were building a studio uh, near his house, of course. 
And I had to do manage the construction to build the fiber backhaul. And we, there was a river between his house and where the fiber was coming. And all these technical things that you have to go through. So I can only imagine from an energy perspective, if you have a depot, you have to go under a sewer line or by a gas line. You're right. You have to, the micro trenching and all the, the permitting process and dealing with the counties and the cities and the regulations, it's, it's going to take time. So you're right to start now. And I want to fast forward here for a minute. When you have the tr- uh, Mr. and Mrs. Truck Driver gets in their electric truck, they're, they're leaving the Penske Depot. Is Penske going to use telematics to monitor that battery health? So that driver, when they're cruising down the road, doesn't say, "Uh oh, uh oh, is the battery going to go? Is it not going to go? Is there is there some t- sort of telematic system using to have that driver where they're like, oh, okay, I don't, I can focus on driving. I don't have to be stressed out about this battery dying." Yeah, I, you know the onboard systems. So what's built into the truck will help the drivers a lot as well. So they'll have a lot of access to estimations of what range is remaining and state of charge. But the the need to do that remotely as well is is a is a big deal going forward. It's a big deal during our learning as well um, to understand uh, if a driver has, let's say, you have a truck that's going to get roughly 200 miles of range, but they need to go 250. Well, they're going to have to stop somewhere. So understanding and planning for that. Um, and like, so where is your state of charge right now? Where are your next few deliveries that you have to make throughout the day and pairing that up to, okay. And where is a charging station that's somewhere in that mix and being able to, to hit it for the, whatever it is, 15, 30 minutes, whatever increment you need to, to kind of quote unquote top off on electrons. So, um, the, the ability to understand remotely what's going on is a big deal. So battery state of charge is a big deal, but as well as battery light, battery health and, and some other parameters that aren't a lot different than what we do with uh, traditional vehicles. But certainly it's, it's a little bit different as far as which components of the vehicle we're looking at and what default codes actually mean uh, when we see them. What other mission critical elements are you using telematics for in fleets today? There's a lot that we're doing with the data. Um, and like I said earlier, we're, we're really focused on aggregating the data from different telematic systems from the, the truck leasing and rental side. You know, we, always, we also have an arm that, that on the logistics side that's using it in, in more traditional uh, fleet management uh, methods. But so I'll, I'll stay on the, the maintenance topic for a sec because it's such a huge uh, piece to how we utilize the data. Um, when you, when we, the, the whole goal is, is uptime for us. So to make sure those vehicles are always running, going back to that idea of full utilization, the truck can't run if it's not, uh, operational. So, um, keeping those vehicles running and getting ahead of any type of breakdowns or failures or issues is, is paramount. So when we can see fault codes from the engines or any kind of data, um, that even a driver might normally be seeing, you know, a lot of drivers I've done it, a light comes on on the dash and you kind of say, Hey, that's great, but I got to get to where I'm going. So I'm going, um, truck drivers do the same thing, but by remotely monitoring it and understanding what that data actually means. So yeah, it may have brought a light up on the dash, but we have engineers and people on our maintenance side that can actually understand okay, they're going to be okay for a few hours and we can monitor it and think of it that way as opposed to, whoa, red light, pull that thing over. Um, so a lot of it's about the human experience and learning and, and everything we know about trucks and tying it to that data. So that's, that's a big piece on the, on the maintenance side. Um, I mentioned a couple of these earlier, but so we, we do preventive maintenance. Um, and I can't, I don't know how many millions of preventive maintenance um, situations we're in every year, but this is a truck comes in two, three, four times a year for preventive maintenance. It's checking everything. It's changing fluids. Um, You know, for us with passenger cars, it's an oil change and it's everything that comes along with it. Um, But we need to schedule those things so we're not taking trucks unnecessarily from customers when they could be using it. So by understanding odometer readings and engine hours, these are big uh, data points that that can tell us when that truck needs to stop for maintenance. 
uh, and we can we can schedule that based on those topics. And then you have kind of the the base blocking and tackling pieces of renting and leasing trucks, and that's we bill based on odometer reading. So just accurate, real time or timely whenever we need it. Um, odometer readings from those vehicles enable us to be very accurate with billing and, and other types of situations. So there are dozens of use cases and we're constantly prioritizing and reprioritizing and making sure the work we're doing on the data and analytics side and building applications, anything we can with the data to make sure we're answering to those use cases because there's so much we can do with the data coming off these trucks to make life more efficient on our side and more efficient and valuable on the, the our customer side. I'd also say you're preparing for the future because I'm starting to sense a trend here by combining your telematics program with a highly respected maintenance as a service program. It seems that you're laying the groundwork for an autonomous trucking future. Am I correct? Yeah, I m- maybe almost accidentally. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's good though. You're always like learning. This, no, yeah, and I and it does. I think. First of all, I'd say the we are well positioned for autonomy, whatever happens there. And I'm saying just the nature of our business. We're very focused on the vehicle. So from a Penske truck leasing and Penske truck rental standpoint. Uh, so when when we think about uptime and and all the services we can we can manage around the vehicle, it's all about that vehicle. So autonomy is not changing anything in particular other than a lot of technology, but it's still a truck and it still needs to stay running, maybe even more so. Um, But everything we're building is just to be better at what we already were doing. So we want to enhance the services we already have. So if, if, if we think about maintenance and we always strive to be best in class at, at maintaining trucks, we, how can we be better? You can be better if you were really good at using the data. We can be better if we do a lot of analysis on what's actually been happening and studying not just real-time data from vehicles, but just uh, historical um, repair order history and a lot of other things. We have so much scale. Um, we are now over 330,000 trucks. So it's, it's the largest non-governmental commercial fleet in the world. And it is, uh, when you think about the scale of that and the, the ability to use the data in different ways, um, it's uh, something that we need to do at that scale, regardless of propulsion system, who's the driver, whatever. But as trucks start to drive themselves, when that comes, we will have trucks that show up at a service location without a driver potentially that's that's not going to be able to get out and say, hey, something's making a funny noise. We're going to have to know what's going on with that vehicle. And so a lot of this work we're doing on the diagnostic side and just remotely diagnosing issues and getting ahead and being as proactive as we can and predictive as we can is going to be even more important when you start to take some of the human elements away from the vehicle. Penske has this historical data on maintenance records and how trucks operate. So if you combine that historical data that you have with your award-winning telematics program and a self-driving stack from a public partner of yours, say Too Simple, for example, to me, it seems in theory that with a partnership like that, those trucks could run 24 seven. Is that, is that kind of where we're eventually going to go with autonomous trucking when there is no driver in the cab, which will then lower the cost of goods? It's going to depend on the use case, but it is, I think that's just like 100% uptime and 100% utilization are the goals now, even though you'll never get there. You'll never get to that 100%. A truck's got to fuel at some point. You've got to do, you've got to touch it, change tires. You got to do some stuff at some point. But if, you know, the, the eventual goal can, can be that. Now it depends on the operation. So if you have, if you think about that distribution center again, trucks loaded up, it's going out for his daily deliveries. It's going to stop to make those deliveries. So there are going to be pieces to it where the truck maybe isn't moving. But um, but when you take the human element away, it is a possibility. 
Now a trucks, like I said, it's a tool, it's a tool for delivering things. So you're always going to load it. You're going to unload it. Um, even if that's a, even if that's a quick, uh, trailer swap at some point, but yeah, I mean, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's all about, um, like I said, it's about uptime and full utilization and autonomy can get you there. It's going to create some interesting dynamics, I think, because now if you keep a truck five, six, seven years, depending on mileage driven in it, you're going to hit that mark much quicker. Um, and the idea of how quickly are you then replacing trucks? And at the same time, if a single truck can go 400,000 miles in a year instead of 150,000 miles in a year, you actually need less trucks at one given time. So maybe you're replacing them quicker, but you're, um, you're getting more per truck, say, from efficiency standpoints. Well, that's really powerful. And the efficiency is a really smart point. And partnerships is another one. Earlier you mentioned the partnership with Freightliner, and I just alluded to your partnership with Too Simple. On the previous podcast, we've had Robert Brown uh, from Too Simple talked about the company's goals and desires of building a win-win partnership. Are you able to speak at a high level what the partnership with Too Simple looks like and consists of? Yeah, I mean, it's really it, it you know, you can you can make it kind of boring and say it's it's a lot like a traditional relationship that Penske has. Um, but, you know, it, it, so they lease trucks from us. Um, now, those are trucks that have a lot of added technology. So there's a lot of understanding there that's that's starting to happen between our companies of of what these technologies mean and how at scale are they going to be um, maintained and, and kept in order. So um, Too Simple recently announced their autonomous freight network and they can think about the technology and the trucks and they can work with fleets on getting the right types of customers from their side to utilize these vehicles to make, to, to run their supply chains. Um, but to grow that network, these are still trucks. These are tr the same trucks that are going to have a lot of the same issues, um, that other vehicles have and trucks have become extremely predictable and very good at what they do MPG wise and, uh, just efficiency wise and, um, very good engineering that goes into them, but trucks are still going to break down. So they still need a service network. And that's where we come in is our ability to take a network that is already existing. So we have over 775 service locations in North America. So as we learn, when we work with, with Too Simple in Tucson early on, we're learning about the trucks and how they're going to operate and what it means for us from a service standpoint. So when they move to Texas, we can start to deploy the same tactics we've used in Tucson in Texas. And then as they move on to other parts of the country, we can do the same thing. So we're learning at a sort of broad corporate level, but then we can deploy that technology and those learnings as Too Simple grows out that autonomous freight network. I love the Penske culture of learning. It just seems like you roll your sleeves up as a culture and you want to learn that can you can, as your partners and partners grow, you can help them expand, but it also benefits your business because then you could take that back to, to other partners or other parts of the, the Penske corporation. So um, I commend you and give you a giant virtual high five for that because it's, it's really uh, smart. Thank you. So we, we have all the pieces of the pie here together and Penske is doing an incredible job operating today in a traditional uh, world where 99.9% .9 of the uh, trucks on the road are driven by humans. But 20 years from now, what does the future of commercial trucking look like? That's a, it's a really good question. And it's pretty, it's pretty exciting question. I think, um, you know, I, so you've got, you know, you've got propulsion systems and, and uh, fueling types. Um, that's a big topic. I think that'll be a, a really, uh, interesting area. So let's, we can talk about EV for a second or, or any type of, um, uh, low emission, zero emission vehicle. Um, you know, I can, I could envision a time when, uh, and you th mix in this idea of distribution centers. So if you have distribution centers kind of outside a Metro area and trucks can bring goods into that distribution center, 
with whatever type of propulsion system. Maybe it's diesel for a long time because they can go from, you know, Nebraska to Southern California and, and deliver that in a stop or two. Um, and then, but maybe from there into the metro and around the metro, you've got EVs and other low, low emission fuels uh, driving those goods around. So then in these areas of high population, you're not adding to the, the pollution and the smog. Um, that I can see when you're talking about a couple of decades out. Um, and then when you mix in the idea of driverless, again, it's going to come down to, is it driverless or is it there's a human in the cab that's going to be doing some work throughout the day but they've now got more time to do, call it some of the paperwork or some of the planning or some of the whatever else they have to do when normally they'd be behind the steering wheel working the pedals. So, um, you know, that'll be really interesting. I think it's hard to predict where that happens. It's, you know, there's regulatory drivers of it. There's technology drivers. There's um, ROI, you know, is how expensive are these vehicles going to actually be? Is it, does it pencil out? Um, sure. Drivers cost money, fuel costs money. Maybe you can save some efficiencies in certain areas, but um, but who's going to do the work? Who's going to unload the pallet of milk when it gets to the grocery store or whatever, whatever is in the back of that thing? So, you know, how that all starts to mix together is going to be really interesting. Maybe it starts with the long haul being more autonomous, so that Nebraska to Southern California route, but then. A human jumps in their EV truck and makes that final mile delivery to the grocery store. So that's how I can see a couple decades out. It may not sound too futuristic, but I think it adds a lot of value. <clears throat> it changes drivers' lives as far as what they're dealing with on a daily basis, how far they're having to drive. Um, it maybe helps to start answer some of the driver shortage pieces. Um, I think there's a lot of interesting things that will happen over the next couple of decades as people start to go back to the idea of practical innovation. It has to make sense, but we're all excited for it. Your vision for 20 years from now is realistic. It's not marketing speak. It's, it's realistic reality. With the realistic reality, Penske's practical innovation, what role do you envision Penske Transportation Solutions playing in that? Yeah, I, I don't want to make it sound too practical. We are pushing as hard as we can. And, you know, EV is a, has been an eye opener for me personally, just seeing and, you know, Penske's done this type of work for over 50 years. These are big expansions. EV is a big difference from diesel or even natural gas or anything else. I think our role needs to be to continue to push these things. These trucks don't deploy themselves. Um, these trucks take a lot of thinking, a lot of manpower. When, when, when we're deploying 20 electric class six, seven, and eight trucks, like we are with the Daimler program, um, that tw those 20 trucks get so much more attention than any other 20 trucks in the fleet. So you've got, you know, VPs and above from multiple departments heavily engaged in this to make sure we understand everything that's happening and has to happen. So weekly calls for years on end um, to make sure these things get deployed right, because we know it's not just a truck. It's there's maintenance, you know, to EVs. Everyone wants to think it's going to be a lot less maintenance and maybe it will. But no passenger car is driving 150,000 miles a year. Um, so there's going to be some interesting learnings from all of that. So, you know, it really takes a village to deploy all this stuff. So when I think about Penske, we have to keep pushing. You know, I think we have a responsibility if we want the technologies to work, if we believe in what they can deliver in the end, then we have to help them deliver that. There, some of these technologies won't be successful without a lot of help from this overall ecosystem of different types of providers, including Penske. And Bill, this has been extremely insightful. It's been interesting. I, for one, have learned a lot. And so as we look up to wrap up this wonderful conversation, I'd like to, to ask you the following. What would you like our listeners to take away with them that they might not already know about Penske Transportation Solutions? I, I'll just go back to what I just said a little bit about um, it takes a village. I think, you know, we can play the part we can, um, but 
when it comes to Penske, you know, we, we think about it as this network and um, there's the, the customer at the center of this network, but it's, there's a human network that we've built out and Roger Penske calls it human capital. Um, it's the most important part of our business. It's where all the expertise comes from. It's over 50 years in the trucking business. And it's our day-to-day -day interactions with customers, with, the, with our partners on the supply side. So working with the various truck providers. And now we're talking about electric uh, charging stations and uh, autonomous providers, very tech-focused things. But it's the human interaction of those things that can make all this stuff come together. Um, so that part of the network is huge. And then we have this, the physical part of our network is the trucks and the facilities and um, everything else that we actually own and deploy. And that's where all this, oh my God, that's a huge fleet. That's all this scale. Um, but again, people have to make the, that, that piece of it work. And then more and more, we're having this sort of digital part to the network that can help tie a lot of these things and drive the efficiency even further. So, you know, when you see a, when you see a yellow Penske truck, uh, that you can rent at the local Home Depot or at a Penske location or at the or at a local gas station. Just know that there's a lot more um, to Penske than I guess meets the eye in that case. That's a great way to close out. And as we've heard throughout this conversation, Penske is customer focused and they're always learning. And Bill, thank you so much for sharing these incredible insights into the the world of trucking. And thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Grayson. Thank you for listening to SAE's Tomorrow Today podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, please kindly rate it, share your feedback, we love comments, and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. For more information on SAE and SAE podcasts, be sure to visit sae.org forward slash podcast and follow SAE on social media at SAEINTL on Twitter and Instagram and at SAE International on Facebook and LinkedIn. SAE International makes no representations as to the accuracy of the information presented in this podcast. The information and opinions are for general information only. SAE International does not endorse, approve, recommend, or certify any information, product, process, service, or organization presented or mentioned in this podcast.